And welcome to SPC's Unleashed Episode 9. Tonight we explore customer centricity and design thinking. This is take two because our first take didn't seem to actually work. Uh, so hopefully this one is working and uh, we are in the capable hands of Stefan tonight. Stefan, I'll take us over to you. Thank you, Mark. We'll make it work. So in this episode, we will explore that Nico is in full swing with an ISO stand. Ali is fighting the constant idea to develop a one-size-fits-all solution <clears throat> and Mark's critical product lens providing context and not an inflation of job titles. So before we knock on the door of my mate's passion or challenges, let me introduce you to this dimension. Customer centricity and design thinking is part of this core competency agile product delivery. And if we look at this core competency, it's all about coming up with the right solution for the right customers and at the right time. So that's a challenge, right? Having good solutions, innovative solutions, and delivering them in a rapid way, in a fast way, in a concise way. So if we dive into the customer centricity and design thinking, Customer centricity, and it's not a surprise, starts again with the mindset, how we do the business, right? And that means we should strive for a positive user experience and good customer engagement. It's not a one-way story, it's a collaboration. It's something that happens between us as an organization, as an enterprise, and the customers and the markets. That means this mindset and the outcomes should then motivate long-term customer relationships. And I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, if I'm looking at the stories of my mates and enabling more customer value, right? And often, and that hit me when I studied the article in an unexpected way, not the usual way, providing those solutions in an unexpected way. Design thinking then is an iterative development process. We should feel comfortable when we hear that because we're used to working cadences, right? So delivering desired products and solutions, they should be feasible, they should be viable. And finally as well, they should be sustainable. So having set the stage, I'm looking to my mates and I would like to know, guys, what is your passion or challenge when it comes to that. And I'm handing over the stick to Mark, your passion. Uh, so mine is absolutely product strategy. I think too many people confuse the word product manager with project manager. Uh, perhaps it's the same acronym, but really getting into product strategy and recognizing product manager and product owner, they've both got the word product in the title and yet too few actually start to think, well, I'm a product, I should know about product strategy and product strategy techniques, uh, whether I happen to be a product manager or product owner. You're not there to manage the work. You're there to create and enhance it. That sounds interesting. I hope to hear more from you when it comes to this passion. Nico, I was surprised. Passion and ISO standards. <laughs> How does that fit? <laughs> Usually not. If you put it so uh, in, uh, at least uh, kind uh, together, it doesn't uh, really match. Uh, but I have a lot of passion for the topic, and I thought we should do two episodes: one about this I'm thinking, and one about uh, customer centricity. Uh, but really, I, I have I have many many passions. Uh, the one thing is really the human centered design, which is an ISO standard, and this was the first thing I did when I was a developer. So I really. Uh, took the standard, worked a lot with the standard, and I was surprised that uh, SAFE has it in the big picture behind me. It has a, a lean UX. And I was a little bit confused because why not an ISO standard? That's why it's one of my passions. It's, it's a, also, as, as I said in the beginning, it's a cycle, it's in, in, uh, um, incremental, um, it's testing things, it's, it's going out, and it's what I've done for uh, my whole life. So my first passion was prototyping, paper prototyping, cardboard prototyping, I really love that and also go out and show it to the people. And second passion after that was personas. And what I also loved a lot is, uh, um, I don't know how, how uh, the market is outside, but in Switzerland, people don't like to argue that they always try to put everything 
make it nice and everything uh, fit together. And what I loved uh, after re uh, re re reading a book is having non-personas. So who is the persona we don't want to work for? Who is the persona we don't want to serve? And this gives you great discussions in the beginning and not afterwards when you have thousands of features and try to paralyze them. Uh, and I remember once uh, uh, the, 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 a division head came as, as a business owner and told us, we have to do this feature, it's so important. And I told her, uh, him, uh, yeah, Eve, and Eve was the non-persona, Eve wants this feature too. And it was so great to see how, how, uh, how the audience uh, reacted. So yeah, it's a feature nobody wants, it's Eve that wants the feature and it's a persona we don't serve was a, a great uh, uh, a swing in, in, in the mood in the, uh, in, in the whole room. So uh, yeah, it's a standard first, it's a prototyping, and it's also personas. And that's for me uh, the things I'm, and you realize Mark told me in the beginning that when I'm passionate, my volume goes up. Sorry for that. I hope uh, people don't bleed out of the ears now in the stream. One can feel your passion, Nico. That's okay. Over to you, Ali. Creativity and a challenge. How does yes, that work yes. together? Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I, I don't get that passionate of ISO standards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what, I, what I'm passionate about is, I mean, I got into the so-called agile business. Uh, not so much because it's a fantastic process or because it's uh, uh, the new hype of uh, these days. I think what it, what it is, is the habits that trigger creativity. Difficult situations, different, difficult decisions to be made, um, but doing that in a way that is experimental, trying to gather knowledge, and with that incremental increase in knowledge, you come up with good ideas. Uh, so the Agile way of working brought me to, I mean, the Agile way of working became an in, a thing of interest because of the creativity that I saw happening with uh, teammates, with engineers, with team members um, that were uh, exposed to challenges and exposed to very early customer interaction. Um, and uh, well, the story that I'm going to talk about a little later is a story about um, uh, something that I've encountered at uh, a couple of teams that I was coaching uh, at a company developing hardware, where in this specific market, it is either you are the first or there's no business at all. So either you are the first with a certain product in the market or you are the second, fifth, twentieth, and nobody's going to buy your product. Um, and keeping that in mind, when if the habit is, you know, we're going to create the most beautiful, fantastic product ever. We're going to gold plate everything and over engineer everything. You know, you're three years down the line. You're not the first in the market. You will not get any customers. There's no business. Doesn't work. Um, and I've been fighting with this habit and this mentality uh, constantly, um, but that generated really nice, cool ideas. Never thought of, uh, and um, then I'm going. That's what I'm going to talk about. Let me pick up that thread and tie it to you mentioned rapid change, and we know if it's change moving from project to product thinking. Mark, you mentioned in your passion, product service strategy, maybe even tactics. And I'm keen to hear your story when it comes to that topic. So it's a funny one when I thought about, you know, what's the story to share tonight? Because, you know, the show's SPZs Unleashed. It's talking to SPCs about how you take people on a journey. And my story is about it. A group of people I didn't have to take on any journey. They just came to a wired for action. Uh, it, it was, uh, weirdly enough, it was a company where the business wanted agility and technology fought it. Um, and, you know, the result of that, it being business driven, was we had the most amazing collection of product managers and product owners. I, I'd never seen anything like it. They all came from years in the field, customer-facing roles, leading customer service centers, 
you know, executives in charge of, of, of service agents. So they came wired with deep empathy for the customers and memories of their frustration when they were on the front line and, and empathy for the staff. And so we talked about product management. We talked about, you know, know the problem, solve the problem, understand your customer, connect with your customer. We introduced some of the, the design thinking techniques and they just took to it. And, and it was a really weird scenario because, <clears throat> because technology was really not on board. The technology delivery side of life was very slow. Right. They, I reckon every PI, they delivered maybe half the features they set out to deliver. And every PI, they delivered more benefits than they set out to deliver. Because the product folks were just so laser focused on picking high value problems to solve. And then whenever a trade-off decision had to be made, lasering into the true value. That, you know, we just got amazing return on investment. And then the other thing that really happened was that the product owners took to heart the job of bringing the customer to life for their dev team members. You know, they'd go out and do pop-ups with the latest iteration of the build and, and they'd go pop up where the customers were uh, and they'd say, hey, let's show you what we're doing, where we're going. And they'd take the dev team members with them. And that, that kind of notion of, you know, design thinking is so much about building empathy. And there's such an anti-pattern I often see, which is the people who do the design thinking are different to the people who do the development. And empathy is a difficult thing to transfer. And, and these customers started to come to life for the developers. And, you know, the, the shift in the culture of customer centricity was just phenomenal. Listening to you, Mark, is, is painting a picture of people who really have this outside in view, right? And you mentioned anti-patterns having more an inside out view. Like, okay. we know what we do. We know the customers. And, and looking to Nico, you mentioned personas. Uh, your story regarding personas. How does that help to avoid this anti-pattern of being an inside out viewer instead of having this perspective uh, and the context of a customer? Yeah, I would really love to connect what uh, Mark said uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning or uh, in, in the story. We need now a different skill set for an SPC or an RTE or whoever, whoever uh, helps the team. It's not a technical skill now, it's a skill of uh, more psychology, a skill of how to interact with people, uh, maybe a skill you cannot learn. I don't know it. Um, but uh, uh, in this story, what is important is really to be able to connect to others. And for that, you have to realize um, as an SPC, as, 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 as an RTE, or as a coach of, of, of people, uh, that people have to be involved. So when you try to do something uh, for a customer, you have to involve the customer. And the same thing counts for personas. If you want that your team uses personas, you have to give them a chance that they can create these personas. So I had once an anti-pattern uh, um, personas was, was, uh, was uh, just new or, or trendy, uh, and the company hired a design agency to design personas. And after uh, felt months, I think it was weak, but it felt uh, uh, centuries, they come back with Cup, uh, cup ports with personas cutting out like like uh, uh, superheroes. And these are our four personas. And they had nice uh, uh, PowerPoints with uh, uh, stories how the personas interact with the product. And it was a huge event, but at the end, nobody uses them because the, it wasn't the, 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 the people's, it wasn't the developers' personas. It was just some new colleagues standing in the wall as a cap board and looking at you, and at the end, they continue working with UML, uh, with UML actors, uh, standard user, uh, advanced user, and then you had the same stupid discussions as before. So you really have to involve the people, and not only involve the customer, you have also to involve developers so they can create or be part of it, of, of creating personas. And that's a new skill set you need as, a, as, an, as, as an SPC. Uh, it's not only the technical one. We see in the last episode how important this is also about uh, the social skills, the skills uh, to listen, psychology skills. That's interesting listening to you guys. Uh, Mark painted a picture where it was almost ideal, 
they picked up problems to solve in a, in a very well way. You, Nico, said, okay, don't leave the personas to the UX and ZX guys. It's us creating value, understanding who we are developing for. So that's kind of the theory. And now reality hits, Ali. You need to be the first on the market. How do you deal with that one as a coach? And how do you leverage this, this yeah, kind of target picture into a context where it's not that case? Well, it, it, listening to Nico, um, I don't think you can replace real customer or end user interaction with a stock photo of potential customer like a persona it's, it's i'm i'm uh, i'm not really a fan of personas because it is uh, a cushion with reality somehow but that's sort of my hot take it's my personal weirdness um the difficult part but also the valuable part of customer centricity is the real the the interaction with the end user which is always very uncomfortable if you are working with a product or working on a product um, that is not done yet and that is not complete yet and um, I, I, I heard you as well Nico talking about uh, earlier talking about that um, uh, we in Switzerland we would like to do things very well we'd like to develop things very well of course that's why what are the most the best engineering uh, engineered watches are all coming uh, this is precision engineering um are, are swiss watches um and it's i think that's a it's an engineering trait i think every software developer mechanical engineer electronic engineer would like to engineer a really well thought beautifully designed sort of gold plated product or component uh, because I, I don't know if I would be making something, then then I think that's when I'm most proud. Because look at my product, beautiful, and it's it can do everything, but it takes very long to to develop. So, um, in the story for today, I've uh, uh, I talked about the uh, the the client where they had to be the first on the market, or otherwise there is no market anymore. So the uh, uh, they they had to. That's the whole point that I was existing, that I was living there, that I was working uh, with them. They had to speed up their time to market because that was a, that was a big issue. So um, in order to do that, you had to create a product that was upgradable or you had to create a product that was developed, that could be developed in iterations, as in you could deliver a version to the market to a very small group of potential customers to get feedback, but potentially also to um, uh, get a loss on it. So, you know, it costs more to develop than you would earn from it, but for the benefit for getting feedback and that customer interaction and so forth and so forth. So um, more than anything, that was really a mindset change, which was extremely difficult for all engineers because normally I'm going to sit down, I'm going to create the most beautiful button on a certain device and that button i'm gonna engineer it i'm gonna design it nicely in cad i'm gonna send it over to uh, a couple of model shops and they're gonna come back with a mold which is sort of a little end house and like a casing that uh, uh, that uh, uses um, uh, a plastic injection to in shape the shape the button uh, but they're gonna you know really overthink it and beautiful things come out but it takes a long time so uh, all of a sudden, there were a couple of engineers that thought about, well, you know what, rather than making one big product that contains all of the capabilities and features and buttons and thingies, um, let's create multiple, knowing that it, the outer casing might change in the second version of the product. But at least we have a first version of the product that can be delivered quickly to the market. Um, so they created what they call the flexible manufacturing line, meaning one manufacturing line that could stay the same, even though over time they would develop different products. Because normally, 
just setting up a manufacturing line might take months. It takes millions to, uh, to do that because you need to configure machines and so forth. Long story. Uh, but it generated the ability to deliver products uh, in iterations. Mark one of the version, that is not Mark Richards, but the version, first version of, of a product to the market. And then after that, the second Mark two of the product and then Mark three of the product, uh, but at least having the ability to deliver quickly. And we thought, fantastic, from engineering point of view, oh my God, we solved the issue. But then the marketing teams completely flipped out. Why? Because what are we going to market? We're going to market a product that is incomplete, a product that doesn't contain all of the functionality. Is that what we need to create marketing material for? Uh, because these products will be placed in the, uh, in the shelves of shops. Um, so anyways, we've, uh, there was, uh, it was actually, there was a, a couple of rogue engineers, if I could call them like that. They were like, you know what, we're going to try it anyways. We're going to try to create a product that doesn't have all of the functionality, but it's going to be a sort of a proof of concept. Uh, in, in the world of engineering, they call that uh, uh, a key prototype or an engineering prototype. And um, at least it's something that is touchable, that you can use. And we're not going to sell it. No, we're going to place it into one of our testing sites. That's what happened. A customer showed up. Customer liked it. Then all of a sudden, the marketing teams were like, hmm, okay, well, you know what? For this time, we, let's do it in, you know, in, 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 uh, in an iterative way. Um, so that became proof. And proof, so the, the, the creative thoughts generated proof, proof generated behavior, and that behavior generated the ability to uh, learn quickly with uh, from a customer um, to deliver to reduce the time to market uh, and uh, build products in an iterative way. But unfortunately, it's still a struggle. Um, even though this entire story took took a took about a year, a little more than a year, um, uh, uh, was a really nice case study. The habits in people are still there to over-engineer, to gold play, to build the most beautiful product and to basically, uh, uh, you know, spend uh, three quarters of a year or an entire year de developing the best possible type of PCB, which is sort of like a motherboard, a PCB um, uh, that contains all of the functionality that could ever be dreamt of by any customer forever. It's, 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 a, it's a habit that is somehow Part of people. So even though there's really good examples, um, there's sometimes still the, yeah, how should I call it, the habit that is, uh, uh, that we need to fight with. Awesome. If mindset becomes habits, and I'm taking the keyword of iterative cadence-based kind of working with teams, with teams of agile teams, Nico, how does that apply to the ISO stand, right? Because we as change agents, we as SPCs, what should we do with that when it comes to cadence, <laughs> to iterative working? So where, where the standard comes in place is really uh, don't losing the touch with the customers. So uh, all is right on the one side. Uh, personas is something scientific, but it helps you to uh, discuss about which part of the features, which, which view on the application do we want to have. So imagine, Ali, in your case, how fast you'd have been when you had personas. Because I believe if you had them, you'd be much more faster and you had much faster product for a certain target group because a persona is nothing more than the incarnation of a, of a, of a, of a, of a segment, uh, of a customer segment. So this standard, uh, uh, Stefan, you asked, it's really about going out and talking with the real people. It's not only sitting and and uh, talking with the personas, they only help you being faster and making faster decisions. So I don't need this golden button because uh, because uh, Granny uh, Granny Georgia doesn't need a, a, a fancy button. She just needs something to push, and then you're faster. But you have to go out and see how Granny's are they. Maybe you have just the wrong images of Granny's, and <laughs> that's what where, where the standard helps you with this interaction and say uh, in, uh, with a cycle, which uh, have an hypothesis. Uh, testing it, uh, programming it, 
going out to the market, make a usability test, and realize, oh, wow, uh, grannies can use smartphones these days. I, uh, I remember years ago, uh, my mother and my mother-in-law were both not capable of using smartphones. Uh, they are now, meanwhile. So also, also our, our, our ideas change, or the world is changing. If you stick only with yourself and don't go outside, that's a huge problem. And I have also a small story about, about this. So uh, when I was a developer, I developed the greatest widget the people had, the universe has ever seen. I was so sure it, it would be, whoa, that's the invention. That's a widget that's missing. It will be standard. It will be go into Windows, into Apple. And then uh, <laughs> I went out just the hallway and asked uh, the neighbors what they think about it. And they were too stupid to understand it. And then I realized they are not stupid. It's just me having crazy ideas. Um, and that's something also I say, uh, it's also part of the cycle, to be honest, going out earlier than it's comfortable for you. It feels uncomfortable for you. Uh, you. You think it's unfinished. I cannot go outside and ask people. But the cool thing is if you go early, you are much more open to discuss if you want to throw it away or not. So imagine I developed this uh, widget for a month too, but then I go out to real customers and they don't understand it. I will try to convince them I will try to sell a training. But if I go out after two days and with paper and, 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 and just simulations, and they don't get it, for me, it's OK to throw it away. It was just one day working. But if I have to throw away one month working, that's a huge problem for people. Have, again, with psychology, you don't want to waste your, your lifetime just by something you have to throw away. And that's also part of the standard, uh, if you interpret it right, making this cycle faster. Faster feedback cycles is something we preach uh, for development. It's also valid for usability. So uh, I'm going to jump in a little bit on that one because like, I love design thinking for so many reasons, but I also see it go wrong for so many reasons. And I, I think one of the biggest problems that I see is people think that design thinking is finished before you start building anything, right? And design thinking is paper prototypes and running around the street, getting people to click your paper and pretend they were interacting with your product. And, you know, the, the design thinking specialists will often say, right, it's, it's expensive to iterate if you get it wrong when you build it. And so we're just going to iterate on paper until we know it's right. And then you can go and build it. As opposed to going, actually, design thinking goes all the way through life. Uh, it, it's, it's that process of going, actually, I, I want to be engaging with and getting feedback from my customers as I build my iterations. I want to be putting iterations of the product, not just in terms of iterating internally, but putting iterations into the market to, to get market feedback on a release pack product. Back to Ali's comment. I love that story, by the way. And, and so recognizing that, you know, the whole design thinking approach is end-to-end. -end. It's not some phase that happens of design. It's a constant engagement and seeking of feedback with customers throughout the life cycle in different ways. It's interesting, Mark. You just described how you motivate long-term customer relationship, right? It's not only creating something, having projects or ambitions or initiatives. It's, it's about the whole life cycle of your solutions, even if you migrate at the end or if you have to replace it. So coming back to all of your th three stories, what, what is probably the biggest challenge from your experience when it comes to this long-term relationship for customers? And we've learned customers is not only external customers, on, also internal customers. Your story, uh, Ali, regarding the marketing team, telling the engineers, guys, this is not a product being, being able to sell or to market. So how would you describe the challenge? How did you solve that? What, what is your experience? What is probably your advice when it comes to this topic? If I may, if I may jump in, I completely agree uh, with, with Mark. It's a discipline that everybody on the team has to do. It's not something you can order in advance, or it be <laughs> much worse at the end. I've seen many usability things at the end, just like a proof, it's, it's usable. And then they start crying and realizing it's not usable. It's, it's, it's a discipline everybody on the team has to be aware of. It's not something 
uh, marketing people are doing or usability people are doing. I think, meanwhile, it's really a skill for everybody. But so, so you go it's, it's a skill that's difficult. It's a skill that is painful. It's like you're trying to cook a dish that you've never cooked before, but yes, you have a recipe, and then trying to taste it while you're cooking it. And it's not done yet, so it might be extremely spicy or extremely salty or whatever, which is the, you know, you're trying to test things along the way, um, but really testing it by putting something out of a pan into your mouth. Uh, so it's real testing. Um, the difficulty there is just um, uh, uh, going to the front line, as how Mark mentioned it. The, the front line exposure is something that doesn't happen that often. I think that's the biggest challenge. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable talking with your customer and then understanding it. I, I don't know. I think that would be the challenge, most biggest challenge. Mark. I, I think we could have had a whole episode just on this one question, I'll be honest. But <laughs> being selective, I, I think there's a lot of people in a product owner or product manager role who never really had a desire to be a product owner or a product manager. The organization came along and, and said, bless you, my son, you're now a product owner. <laughs> and they, they pick up, I avoided gesticulating, but they, they pick up this notion that, you know, their job is now write features and write stories and set priorities and manage the team. And knowing where to start, right, particularly if they didn't necessarily come from a fluffy background uh, or a creative background, you know, where do they start? And, and that's where I think working with them to say, let's actually help you apply these techniques. Uh, if you think about design thinking and, and you know, so let's say all the techniques that, that the Agile product management course has in it, um, let's help you do empathy interviews. Let's help you build user personas. Let's help you build a user journey map. Uh, you know, one of my favorite techniques um, is prune the product tree. You know, if you're unpacking an epic, let's go build, prune the product tree and let, let's go and test our product tree ideas with our customers. Or, you know, let's bring some customers into a workshop for a story map because, you know, they might not come, and back to Nico's point, they might not come with these soft skills to begin with. But if you can give them tools and go, well, let's take the fear out of it, right? Let's play with a product tree. Let's play with a, a story map and give you a tool set that enables your interaction with the customer and build your confidence. Then that's going to start the rich discussions. And if you can start the rich discussions and you can really start that mindset of, oh my goodness, everything changes when I start doing this then it becomes a self-reinforcing loop. If I may summarize so far, what, what I hear is it's a huge shift of paradigm, right? We're coming back to the mindset. So for a developer, that would mean, hey, I'm not there to code like hell. It's, as you said, Mark, understanding mm -hmm. and, and being part like of this exercise, pruning the tree, first of all, laying out all possible uh, options we have and then working on that one so mindset again and let me try to close the loop here what kind of anti-patterns do you see have you experienced and what, what's probably some good advice as change agent in that case related to your stories your challenges you faced so i'm handing over the talking stick to ali first because you had the challenging story. Um, I don't know. I, I wrote it down as uh, in, in our Miro environment, I wrote it down as the just one sentence, uh, which is, it is still a sentence, it, even though it has two commas, but it is still a sentence. Technically. It's prove it, scale it, and bite into it, or <laughs> prove it, scale it, and stick with it, or something like that. So what does that mean? It is just, Prove that there's a benefit of early customer exposure and uh, early, let's say, empathizing with customers. Prove that it works. 
uh, and and that means maybe that you need to find a way to make it less scary. You need to um, um, find a way to um, uh, make it less. Yeah, how should I call it? Politically sensitive. So what do I mean with that? Uh, you know, imagine your you know, your product owner or a few of your product owners all of a sudden reach out to a huge customer, some, some account lead at a huge customer. Well, then you're bypassing the marketing team. You might bypass all kinds of other, you know, product management. You might bypass, uh, I don't know, your system architect who, who might be very much in contact with, with, the, with the customer or customer field. Um, and, and that bypassing of people, I don't know, it, in, in, in some companies, that, that's just really a no-go. Um, so it's, uh, I would say, try to find a way, like a very sort of low-level, not-so-extremely-dangerous type of um, scenario in which you can reach out to a customer, sit down, spend the time to exchange on thoughts, um, exchange on prototypes, um, if that requires the customer or the, the customer group to sign a non-disclosure agreement or some form of um, intellectual property protection kind of thing, figure that out. Uh, but try to try to do it first, learn from the approach, highlight the benefits, try to scale it up with more teams, and so on. So, so is it fair to say, Ali, that you're saying do it at a reform? Actually, yes. Actually, even customer exposure, you know, figure that out iteratively. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? And I like the bit where you say bite into it, right? <laughs> That's where mindset becomes a habit. Okay. Nico, you're just one thing that <laughs> summarizes your story, your experience. Maybe your advice to, to us as change agents. I try to do a trick by just putting many commas in it and make a long sentence be one sentence. But uh, at the end, I end up with Ali's sentence, uh, to, do, to be uh, really honest. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a team sport. And as an SPC, help the people be able doing this team sport by going out. I wouldn't say prove it, because prove in, in my environment sounds like uh, this would be bulletproof. <laughs> so, but go out and try to find out if you're going the right direction. and leave it so early your desk that it feels for you unfinished then it's the perfect moment when you feel it's finished and you go out it's too late so go out test it while it feels unfinished awesome mark how to avoid an inflation of job titles related to products look for me it's know what the product you own or manage is and who the customers are. And, and it's amazing how often you can talk to a product owner or a product manager, you ask them that question, it becomes an interesting discussion. And then once you know what the product is and who the customers are, and, and it could be an external customer, it could be an internal customer, depends on your topology of your, your team design and your art designs. Once you know, be relentless in your pursuit of understanding and feedback. That's an awesome springboard to, yeah, we can have assumptions, we can have hypotheses, but how do you measure and grow? And let's go to this section. And I saw that Nico put some stickers on it, even on titles, and we have some arrows. <laughs> okay, up to you, Nico. Lead us through this checklist. I will try to be provocative. So uh, in, in my case, I think the whole customer need part is so important that I don't want to dive in in the subsections. I think customer need is, is, uh, is so important. But I also want to shake a little bit the people uh, because there are things in like uh, roadmaps are important. And some people, when they hear roadmaps, they just think, so, oh, boring, it's just a timeline and some uh, things in it, uh, it's boring, had nothing to do with usability or, or uh, with user-centered design. And I put the positive that why I would choose this one. So if I only have to choose one, it would be this one just to shock the people a little bit and say there's more about roadmaps than just this time thing. Prune the Prodigy, Mark uh, already told us, Prune the Prodigy is also a roadmap tool. 
it's not a time-centered roadmap. It's, it's a roadmap about content. So uh, just open your horizon. Just because uh, uh, um, uh, roadmaps sounds waterfalling, it doesn't mean they are old or they are, they are uh, not nice or they are, they are uh, boring. Road mapping is much, much more. That's why I put my sticky there, just to be a little bit provocative. Let's go into a discourse. Ali, what do you think about Nico's rationale about measure and grow customer needs and creating value? So, okay, the question here is, if I'm an SPC and I would like to develop this dimension, the, the dimension of customer centricity, um, then out of everything that I can look at, to, to try to understand growth, what would I look at? I think the use of roadmaps is a good one, but I think if I have to make a choice, uh, if, if, I, if I have to make one choice, um, it would be much more the ability of people, teams, product owners, whomever, whomever to interface with whomever can influence the roadmaps. Um, so to interface as in, uh, who is your customer? Well, talk with these people. Is, are these people indeed ready to absorb, acquire, use your product or solution or your, the functionality, whatever you're developing? Um, so the whole notion of Gemba, I think it's very underrated. Um, interfacing with, with, you know, are your people actually reaching out uh, and, and, and testing assumptions? That includes, are your people reaching out and in a way testing the roadmap? Uh, is, the, the, is the customer field ready to absorb whatever you're developing? Uh, so I, I, I placed my little post-its in our Miro board at our art reachers, uh, uh, research uh, customer experience through Gemba, uh, hence um, interfacing with customers. How do you explain Gemba for those who have never heard the world, word? Because it changed a little bit in SAFE uh, in, the, in the trainings and the latest. So Gemba is just somewhere one of the 10,000 words. How do you explain Gemba? Yeah, indeed. Uh, some, some, in some literature, it is uh, being translated to go see. But, you know, it's just get out there, you know, <laughs> leave your office and your laptop, please. You know, go to wherever the, your product or the solution or the functionality that you're developing or have developed is being used. So just, just, um, uh, Talk, people, just talk. Not, not, no emails or whatsoever, no Slack channels, just listen and talk. Sounds good. Before the episode, Mark and I, we put our sticky next to our art builds empathy with the customers so that we understand what their needs are. And I saw Mark moving his <laughs> mark. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> da, dum, da, dum. Yes, Mark, your reason. So I must confess, it was really interesting looking, not looking, could have been interesting looking. It was really interesting listening to Nico explain his motivation around the roadmaps. Because I must confess, I saw that he picked roadmaps and I went, that really surprises me. And, and then I listened to it and I went, you know what? I, you'd almost buy that if you put Rolling Wave in bold. And, and it's that cognitive bias and what it really showed me when I, when I was listening to Nico is my cognitive bias is when I read that, I read Roadmaps, I didn't read Rolling Wave. And of course, Rolling Wave is, <clears throat> it's a roadmap that will change based on what we learn. And, and that's probably one of the challenges I have with Roadmaps in organisations is that the Rolling Wave bit is filtered out when people hear it. But what... <laughs> Every week we do this, what's the one thing you do? It's an interesting challenge for me. And I wind up more and more sitting in, if I can move this needle, it moves other needles. Exactly. And 
you know, you listen to Rolling Wave, well, that enables you to start to deliver iteratively because the organisation embraces the fact a robot might change. Kind of like that. You build empathy. Well, you've got a chance of building the right thing. And to me, Gemba Walk, well, that's just a flavour of building empathy. Uh, go to where the work happens and, and you gain deeper understanding. But often the, there's a truth that I experience, which is it doesn't matter how you talk about this, and back to you, I think your story is a great example from the marketing people, Ali, is you can have the best user research and empathy in the world and the best intent about a rolling wave roadmap, but the, if the organisation doesn't buy into the value, right, and, and whether I'm talking politically or the developers, right, if they don't buy the value, you're in trouble. And, and I think if you get feedback, and particularly if you get feedback in the form of metrics, Maybe that feedback says we built something that all our research told us would be wonderful and then nobody's using it. Or maybe the research says we, they're using it differently to how we expect it. And when I want to go and change my roadmap or I want to get people to spend more time building empathy, I can go, here's why. And I realised that I didn't think deeply enough about it when I made my first choice because I joined Stefan on Build Empathy. But I listened and I thought, and I went, well, why do I, how do I motivate people to build empathy? Uh, show them their baby's ugly. Just listening to both of you, I'm going to move my post-it. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm moving my post-it to our art uses rolling wave roadmaps. Uh, because I'm 100% convinced by what you just mentioned, Mark. And also just thinking about, well, what Nico is saying is, it is not only getting feedback, but it's also continu continuing to adjust the long-term view. So it's actually a double thing. So you're not only sort of reacting constantly, but it's also re reacting and uh, showing the impact on the long-term view. Uh, I'm convinced. I changed my opinion. Thanks. That's an interesting session, and that's guys why I like uh, talking to you guys on a weekly basis, right? It's really the pinnacle of the week for me. Why is that? Let me let me start with the one thing that I posted is don't jump to conclusions. After over thirty years in 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 the field in the trenches, I still tend to jump to conclusions, right? When it comes to customers, yeah, I know them. It's this inside out view. Or when it comes to design thinking, yeah, I know what to do. I'm jumping directly. And that's why I put my sticky to build empathy first. If you don't know who you're talking with, who you are developing for, you probably don't understand the challenge or the problem space, right? And, uh, the older I grow, the older I get, the the world becomes more simple. It's a people business for me. It's having this rapport with people, working with them together. And, and what I find over the time is in all those ambitions, initiatives, transformations, I meet people and they become friends. And that's why I leave my sticky note to empathy maps. Although, guys, you're drawing me towards the, the, the one thing that, and that's for me the conclusion uh, of today on, on my personal uh, basis. How do, you, how do you make a mindset set tangible? How does the mindset become a habit, the way we work? And then I probably would move my sticky to the rolling wave roadmaps as a central part. And I must admit again, and I like it because we, we think alike. The first thing I always, always ask PMs and POs, where's the roadmap? Not where's the backlog. I always ask, where's the roadmap? So we're a little bit ahead of time. May, may, may I, Stefan, add, add, add something? Uh, I'm so happy not being the moderator because now it's your responsibility to uh, <laughs> to make the curve back. Um, uh, when you told uh, jumping to conclusion, I think uh, we all have an IT background and we've been trained as, as engineers. 
to find always the right solution. That's why it's in our DNA and we have to go away from it. Um, my point of view as coach and the episode is called, or all episodes, the whole uh, series is called uh, SPCs Unleashed. Uh, for me, I told some episodes before, uh, systemic coaching is very important. And there you have a different viewpoint on things. You're not coaching the person. You're not coaching the problem. You're looking on the relationship on the person, the problem. And that helps me not jumping into solutions. So when I am there as a coach of a coach, I always look how this person interacts with the solution or the problem or, or whatever he's interacting or she's interacting. And that helps me not jump in the conclusion because I'm irrelevant for the person. I'm irrelevant for the, pro for the problem. My job is just to see how the person interacts with the thing. And that's my job to help them cr uh, create the better interaction in between. And that helps me now go away from my engineer background to always have the right solution. Thank you very much, Nico. And I take that as the final words. And I'm handing down the talking stick to Mark again to close this session for us. So I'm actually going to sneak in the final words. Uh, and, you know, that's the power of having the talking stick. So here's my sneak in. Uh, uh, jumping to conclusions. Sorry, you triggered it and now I have to say it. There are some, like, if you think about general product techniques and design thinking techniques, a lot of the design thinking stuff is, is designed to test your assumptions. And it's actually one of the reasons why, despite the fact that it's not an ISO standard, I like the Lean UX book because I think it gives a lot of practical techniques around that. Uh, but there's another book that I really enjoyed, which was by Ash Maria, and I'm going to stick the link in the chat in just a second. And the book was called Running Lean. Uh, iterate your product from, or iterate from plan A, to a plan that works. And he actually has some stuff in there, which is basically generating a list of assumptions and then um, deliberately going out and testing the, the list of assumptions you've generated as part of your design thinking process. And uh, I found it very useful, right? However, um, wrapping up as I should have just wrapped up, that brings this episode to a close. Uh, and, you know, as always, we will um, shift to, uh, we've got a bunch of book links and things from our favorite books in these topics uh, on our Miro board. Uh, we've got some extra notes or perhaps reminders of the story. We'll be shifting them into the publicly accessible bit. If you're curious when you're listening and you didn't perhaps catch a book title or a reference we made. But this ends the formal part of this show. Uh, and the way we actually always end the show is with a quick retrospective or debrief uh, to support our relentless improvement efforts and our iteration Which of the show format. Which we are going to do in, we are going to do in absolute secrecy. While we continue to stream it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs>